and we'll jump on. Uh, so I thought I'd start today's session with uh, what is actually in an EOTC system. Um, and this is very high level and will differ um, across schools as it should, because you need to make it your own. Uh, so three key parts, and um, two of them on this slide. Uh, first one is the EOTC policy. Okay. Uh, why? Why we do EOTC in our school? And often a bit about what that EOTC actually is. What does it include when we think about EOTC at our school? Uh, sometimes that policy will have um, responsibilities in there, particularly uh, board and principal responsibilities normally sit in that EOTC responsibility, uh, so policy. Uh, sometimes it outlines responsibilities across all of the different roles, so down into the coordinator type responsibilities as well in that EOTC policy. Other times that will sit down in the EOTC procedures. Uh, so second part, EOT procedures, um, how we do EOTC in our school. Um, I, If I was to walk into your school and pick up your EOT procedures um, or um, look them up online, um, I should be able to see how it happens in your school. Um, and then I should be able to do it as any one of your staff members would. This basically spells out the um, the rules or the guidelines for all the different bits and pieces that make up EOTC in your school. Um, so EON, Education Outdoors New Zealand, EONS, has a safety management plan template. And this document um, is a template that basically does both parts of um, those first two parts um, for EOTC. So the first part in it has some policy and then the second part um, spells out the different procedures. And this is the front page of it, if you've seen it or adapted it. Uh, it has some instructions that you delete once you use it the first time, and it has a whole bunch of blue writing that becomes your school's thought think, uh, thinking. Um, and with all of the pieces of um, support and templates that come out from eons in the Ministry of Education, um, they're all about giving you guidance, but allowing you to make these things your own, which is really important, of course. Uh, so I just took a couple of little screenshots um, from different parts of it. So you can see just a snapshot of the things that are in that safety management plan template. And it forms the middle between the EOTC guidelines from the Ministry of Education and the toolkit or the forms that you're using to manage EOTC. Uh, third part of the system is that toolkit of forms and it's providing you um, support uh, around how you collect and manage all of the information you need and all of the planning you do. Really great idea um, with that toolkit of forms is to create and lots of schools I know will already have this um, in some shape or form, but the idea of a flow chart or a diagram or a workflow about how all those forms that you're using in your EOTC fit together. Um, and that might be different for low risk activities. And in fact, EONS of course would say, absolutely, it should be different um, for low risk activities compared with high risk activities and then overnight. And so, some workflows and flow charts, diagrams, whatever makes sense to you within your school and your staff as to how those things fit together. Any questions so far? Hopefully, Heather, you've been able to work out your audio. Uh, so here's just a wee um, screenshot of the forms um, as they exist at the moment. Uh, you can see they've all got 2018 um, at the back. So the whole lot, oh, sorry, no, I should say before I get on to the next part, all these three parts of your system um, sit under and guided by the EOTC guidelines. Uh, so 
that's your overarching guidance. Then you've got a policy and procedures that say what it is, why you do it, and how you do it in your school. And then you've got the tools and forms that support how you do it. Uh, a good example um, of the middle bit that would sit inside the safety management system with, um, is for transport. So within that um, safety management plan, you would have a section that's transport, and in there it would tell your staff member um, if they wanted to book a bus, how they would go about that, or who they go and see to book the bus. If they're using the minivan, uh, this is the system for booking it at our school. Uh, this is what needs to get checked. This is who does that checking. Uh, this is where you get the fuel card from. You have to have a full license. You have to have done the induction on driving the school van. Uh, you have to, um, here's where you get the fuel card from. Here's how you use it. And you need to fill it up when you bring it back. And this is the transport form that you need to fill out for any students that you're taking in that van. So it's not just the form um, and list of students that might be going in that van. It's just really spelling out all of the things um, that you have to do around transport in your school. And then sitting up above that is the guidance out of these EOTC guidelines and what they tell you about transporting students. So it all fits together. Ah, yep, a definition of a high risk activity. Um, so that's uh, that's a really good question and obviously a very topical question. Well, that's only muting you. Yeah, but I've unmuted it. Oh, um, so there is some guidance around uh, what might be considered high risk um, compared to low risk in the safety management plan template. Uh, and what you're really looking for is activities that are um, out of what might be considered um, things that would happen in a normal school day. Uh, so uh, activities that involve um, water immediately um, go into that high risk uh, category. Uh, things that involve um, the possibility of falling or heights, either falling off things um, or having things fall on you, and speed um, primarily, but also um, things that involve um, kind of chemicals or moving machinery, so farm visits often um, would slip into that high risk category where there's um, more risk and hazards than you would meet in a normal school day um, or um, in your weekend at home. But particularly concerned with water, heights, speed, and um, kind of exposure to uh, moving parts and machinery and, and chemicals. Um, also, it's considering a little bit of um, uh, temperature as well at, at the real extremes. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this later um, when I pop up a couple of things, but hopefully that's sort of started you thinking about what some where some of your activities might fit. Uh, so um, all of these three parts plus the EOTC guidelines are currently being reviewed. Uh, they're a fair way down the review process. So the toolkit and the safety management plan template, we're hoping to have out uh, fairly near the start of term three. Uh, so they're off with the format, formatters now. Uh, we've pulled out um, aquatics. Um, and the aquatics consent form out to a separate document in there. Um, there's a couple of new forms and a lot more examples, and we're really changing the layout of the forms to hopefully make stuff a whole lot easier. Also creating a toolkit for EOTC coordinators. So there's been a sort of a missing gap of how EOTC coordinators manage the information that they need. Uh, 
Uh, so things like um, there'll be a checklist of coordinator responsibilities, um, a systems review checklist. So you, when the coordinator, um, if they have the responsibility of reviewing the EOTC systems, they've got something to review that against and make sure they have all the pieces of that puzzle. Uh, there's going to be an inductions uh, checklist for um, EOTC coordinators inducting staff into EOTC and an activity competence uh, spreadsheet and a staff competence spreadsheet and I'll flick up some little examples of those in a second. Uh, we're really hoping that the toolkit and the safety management plan template will be ready um, and in the EOTC um, PLD, safety management PLD, um, that is running next term. Uh, the EOTC guidelines are also under review. Uh, that process uh, takes a little bit longer uh, because um, EONS um, makes recommendations um, to the Ministry of Education and then um, because it's a ministry document, um, it has to work its way through um, their processes before it's published. Uh, the recommendations we're making are all around trying to simplify and clarify um, parts of the guidance um, strengthening the advice on supervision and working with external providers and bringing in that focus on inclusion into there. So um, there's lots of opportunity while you're waiting for those um, reviewed documents to be available. Uh, and um, one of those is creating a review plan for the next year uh, so that you're kind of spacing out what the EOTC coordinator or the leader of EOTC in your school is actually doing. And I think a really good place to start is uh, EOTC stock take, if you haven't looked at one of those for a while. So huge piece of paper or a big whiteboard or multiple whiteboards um, and really look at all of the different EOTC that's happening in your school, including sport, and those extracurricular activities, um, cultural activities and events, and recreational events as well, clubs, that type of activity, and just get that really big EOTC picture. And then once you have that overview, trying to work uh, into some categories, and in the new uh, safety management plan template, we've worked with three categories, um, we've got low risk, and then we've got medium to high risk, and then overnight category. Uh, the reason we're looking at doing it that way is because when we're creating the safety management plan template, we're looking at the tools and the things you might have to do within school for the different risk levels. And medium and high actually pretty much have the same tools and thinking in their management. It might make sense when you're doing this overview um, to separate that out and have low, medium, high risk categories. Overnight, we've also um, have made a separate category. And that is because often it involves uh, approval from the board for overnight activities. Uh, that is completely a school decision um, where the approval um, for activities sits. Um, but we've made that a separate category um, in our thinking because it does involve um, different management um, than just being out for the day. Once you've done those first two bits um, and you're somewhere kind of in the end of term four by now, uh, if you look at activity, each activity or groups of activity, mm -hmm. and then start to think about um, what competencies are required to lead that activity. And it might, um, groups, activities often fall into pretty natural groupings where you can see once you start doing this task that actually the competencies required for that, those activities are really similar or the same. Um, if we think particularly in the low risk area, um, trips to the local park, uh, going to the supermarket to do some study uh, down around 
doing a, a nature study um, under the trees, okay, just across the road from school, um, those types of activities might easily sort of be clumped together and require the same competencies to run. Um, so here's a little example. This is one of the tools that won't look like this when it comes out in the AOTC coordinators toolkit, but something similar will. Uh, so you identifying your activity, uh, you're identifying the risk associated with it. And in this one, you can see it's broken down even more than that into the um, date of the activity and the, the class groups that are going uh, and where they're actually going. Uh, the bits at the end are important, uh, identifying if there's environmental factors that are related to the activity is a really good thing to think about, um, particularly uh, as our um, environmental factors become more extreme and difficult to manage. So actually identifying those and then really thinking carefully about how we manage them. And then looking at, for that particular activity, are there qualifications required by school? Um, again, uh, most, in pretty much all the cases, that's your decision as a school to make, um, whether you require your staff to have a qualification. Um, look to industry, look to good practice about what those qualifications are, and I'll point you in a direction to do that in a second. And then what experience that goes alongside those qualifications. Uh, so I think it's really important that competency is not just qualifications, it's experience and all of those factors that you know wrap around um, to make a competent um, supervisor. Uh, this one's also got the little safety equipment required um, column. Um, you don't necessarily have to have that. This was, was an example that combined a number of things. Um, you wouldn't want to do this individually for every activity. That's why, particularly in low risk, it's good clumping them together. And as soon as you start working through this process, you see that actually there are big clumps um, where the qualification required um, is your teaching qualification. Um, and the experience required is some group management out of the classroom. And maybe a first aid certificate. So the next step on from that activity, which is just related to the activity, is to then think about your staff that you have and how you um, develop the professional development that those staff have, uh, as well as what they've brought to school when they arrive, how you measure that and decide whether that uh, needs further development, and then how you record that. And this is another one that will come out in the EOTC coordinator toolkit. Okay. Um, and you can see all sorts of different information in there. Um, some of you will have um, online uh, student management systems that manage your staff as well. And so looking to see whether um, different columns can um, fit into there and you can manage your staff that way. Uh, this is just simply an Excel sheet. So there's all sorts of ways of doing it couple of important things in here, I think, um, for you to consider. Recording the experience that staff have, so what they've actually done um, for you at school, okay, what trips they've taken um, over the years, and then what PLD they've been on. It's kind of easy um, to track qualifications, um, but keeping a record of those other two things um, becomes a bit trickier if you don't do it at the time and set up a system to do it. And the real benefit of that is if you as the EOTC coordinator or the person who's making these judgments about is that staff member appropriate to run that particular activity, if you've gone and um, there's a completely new person in that school and this information hasn't been recorded, it puts them in a really difficult position to try and make those decisions based on evidence. Just have a quick check through because I can see there's um, quite a few questions coming up. Uh, so good question here about uh, do overnights automatically come high risk? And I think no, um, they're not automatically high risk, 
but we've put them in a separate category because as soon as you're staying overnight, there's some other things that you need to consider and check. Um, and particularly if you're using volunteers, uh, there's some um, checking and risk assessment around using uh, volunteers um, in the child protection space. So they're just a little bit different and need a wee bit more, or a wee bit different consideration. Doesn't necessarily put them into the high risk category. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, old template from Google, nightmare. Um, all of the forms, let's be honest, all of the forms are terribly formatted um, from way back in the day. Um, and it's the one thing we're really conscious about. Um, so they're with a company formatting them now. Um, they will um, sit uh, in a Google friendly, and in fact, I think they're even going to sit um, in the Google platform, um, but uh, well aware that they might be used in all sorts of different platforms. So yes, um, we are also making sure they are formatted um, for those that need to print them out as well. Um, so not only will they hopefully be way better um, embedded into electronic systems, whether that's Microsoft, Google, or something else, um, but also if you, if you do need to print them out, they'll be in a format that is um, friendly for that as well. Uh, I'll come back to that one. All right, so our aim is um, for the coordinators templates to be out um, hopefully reasonably soon next term. Um, we'll get the toolkit done first, or the EOTC toolkit, and then this one will be the next cab off the rank. There's five forms, um, so it it shouldn't take too long um, to get that done. Uh, yep, this recording will go up um, onto our EOTC safety management um, site. And if you want the, well, so you'll be able to see the PowerPoint. If you want the PowerPoint for anything else, just email me. I'm happy to um, flip that over to you. Um, yeah, so medium high risk. Um, was principal's approval and permission. Uh, it, some schools um, are saying that's board as well. Um, that is completely a board decision. Um, there's nothing in the guidelines that says it has to be um, anywhere in particular. Um, overnight, um, mostly um, seems to sit with board approval, um, but even that, I would suggest that uh, the board have um, responsibility and absolutely know, need to know and be assured that there is a robust system in place, um, that it's good practice, it's current practice, and it's being used as it should be. Uh, but often the expertise about knowing um, the appropriateness of the supervision structure and the staff on the event, um, the actual ins and outs of the event, they sit um, within the school um, with the principal or the EOTC um, senior leader or sometimes the EOTC coordinator. And that is a school decision to kind of work out where the best expertise for making those decisions sits. Uh, always good practice for the board to know what EOTC is happening in their school. Um, you know, so they should be seeing the EOTC calendar and be aware of the level of EOTC that's happening, uh, really know how the system works and that it's in place. But often those, the technical expertise and the knowledge of staff and supervision and requirements, um, you know, sits down at that operational level within the school. Great questions, team. Uh, so another, yep. 
another thing to do while you're waiting for these uh, new uh, toolkits and templates uh, and the EOTC guidelines is to check out the good practice guides. Um, so I've just put a snapshot of all the ones that are available there. Um, we are adding to that list all the time. Um, so it pays to you know, have a system where the EOTC coordinator checks back in with um, what's sitting there as good practice guidelines. Um, one that is um, really useful for everyone to check in to is the driving guidelines and checklists. Um, that's been pulled from all over. Um, a whole lot of guidance, existing guidance, has been pulled together to create those guidelines. So a really useful place to check. Uh, they um, are accessed through our website. Um, and I'll show you in a second where you can find them. Um, yeah. Something to consider if your system or you're still talking RAMs or ratios, um, I'd encourage you um, to pop into the Zoom recordings section of our website and watch um, the Zoom on supervision structures and also there's one on working with risk assessment. Um, both of those terms um, are a little bit dated now. Okay, so um, it's a, a good way to get up with current practice is to pop in and see the terms that we're using and the rationale and try and understand the rationale of why those things have changed. Um, and the other good thing to do would be to book onto the EOTC um, and Effective Safety Management Systems, PLD. Um, that all got delayed from um, this term. And it's all into term three now with um, the industrial action. So we've just got fingers crossed um, that we're going to be okay. Um, it is safety related, um, PLD, and um, doesn't run too late in the day. Uh, I think um, the Auckland and Christchurch workshops next term are full, um, but we do run a wait list um, and then we can go back to the ministry if our wait lists get big enough and um, ask them to fund some more. Uh, but the regional ones can still definitely hold some more numbers. Um, so I'll show you in a sec where to jump onto our website and have a look if there's one in your region. We run 10 across the country um, every year. Um, on behalf of the Ministry of Education. Uh, so on our website, finding things. This is another thing that's getting reviewed very shortly. Um, but the easiest way onto our website, which is uh, eonz.org.nz, uh, across the top bar, um, this is EOTC management. This is the landing page you'll come to. But down the side, you will find um, the EOTC management Zoom series. That's where those recordings sit. And uh, there's a whole series of them there. There's the two I mentioned, but there's also ones on creating standard operating procedures, transportation, school sport, all sorts of things in there. Oops, sorry. Uh, it's also where you find the safety management template and toolkits but they're the old ones. So there's plenty of other things you can do while you wait. So I wouldn't, if you're not um, familiar with those, um, just wait until the new ones come out. Uh, and further down in the list is the good practice guidelines and that link will take you through um, to those guidelines. And almost down at the bottom is the National EOTC Coordinator Database. Uh, but you'll also see that on our very front page. And just click on the orange button. Uh, so um, one of the other services um, we offer on behalf of the ministry um, is uh, EOTC support, uh, an email address uh, where you can get in touch with me um, or um, our facilitators that work in this space, and we can support you with your tailored questions. Uh, we're doing more and more kind of individual support with schools. Um, we can answer some questions and have a quick Zoom um, with you, um, but we've got a number of schools that are actually 
um, coming and asking for support reviewing systems that has a cost associated with it because it's not funded out of the Ministry of Education um, but that support is there um, if needed and absolutely definitely um, there's plenty of room to support any questions um, happy to jump on a zoom and spend an hour with you um, chatting through questions or get one of my facilitators to do it so that that support is is there so uh, a chance now for any kind of final questions if anyone wants to pop off mute You obviously did such a fabulous job, Fiona. Thank you. <laughs> um, there was one question I haven't answered, um, and it's a comment on the KMAR EOTC platform. Um, I have had a um, quick tour through there. Uh, I haven't talked at any length to um, schools that are using it. I know there's a couple of schools who are um, going to give it a go and see how it goes. Um, and there'll be a little bit of updating they will need to do um, once um, the new toolkit and safety management plan come out. There's a couple of things in there that aren't um, quite current um, at the moment. Um, we do work with um, a number of commercial providers. Um, so we're working closely um, with Schoolbridge uh, and um, they are uh, absolutely committed to making sure all of their material is up to date and they're um, completely aligned um, with what we're doing. Um, we also um, share our documentation with uh, school docs. So um, it's the EONS forms that you will link to um, off school docs if you're using school docs. Um, I would really encourage um, you making sure your school docs site and that EOTC policy and procedures is your own. I think um, there's, it's really important that schools um, engage and really make sure that material um, is outlining EOTC as it happens in your school. Um, I, I do go into schools and uh, you know, the, looking at their documentation, it'll say one thing, but actually the practice is completely opposite or, not, or it's just not that. Um, and in some ways, that's almost worse than not saying it. Um, so yeah, really important that if you're using a platform like School Docs or um, you've got your own um, systems within school that they are saying the same thing as you are doing. Um. Okay, so a uh, question here around kind of where the buck stops um, and um, and with an accident, um, especially in a high risk event, and that that's a particularly hard question to answer um, because there are responsibilities at each level of the school, and it, it really depends. Um, so the board have that ultimate responsibility to make sure the EOTC um, safety management system is current. Uh, it is. Um, thorough and has all the bits it needs to and it is being implemented as it should be uh, and then there's a whole lot of operational responsibilities um, around that implemented as it should be piece um, so that uh, what's being said is actually being done and particularly around that supervision piece and making sure that competent staff um, are supervising um, all EOTC uh, and really thorough th thought has been put into um, the planning of that EOTC. Um, so it's hard to say um, everyone has responsibilities um, within that system. Um, when you're working with an external provider, some of the 
well, a whole bunch of those responsibilities are shared and that um, requires you to have robust discussions with them and a really good understanding of how those responsibilities are shared, who kind of has the lead in different parts of um, that EOTC event. Classic example is um, going off to a provider for a school camp. Uh, the provider uh, instructors, uh, they have the lead responsibility for their groups doing the technical activities, uh, whatever those might be. They come back for lunch, the instructors go on lunchtime um, to have their lunch. Who has responsibility? Ha is it clear that the school staff who are there that's their time to have a responsibility. And it's also where most of the incidents happen in free time. Um, so being really clear, uh, and the other part, part to be clear around is emergency procedures um, and who has the ultimate responsibility in that space when you're working with a provider. Because um, it's, it's extremely likely that those responsibilities will be shared. Um, they might have the responsibility for the immediate reaction and first aid and calling uh, 111, but it's highly, highly, highly likely that the school will have the responsibility for notifying um, caregivers and whānau and, and managing um, that aspect. So it's really important that you have that discussion beforehand um, and then things can run a whole lot more smoothly when they need to. Uh, so um, hopefully, just a question here around PD when it's booked out, um, you sh hopefully our system just is automatically doing that. Um, if you run into any issues or you're not sure if it put you on a wait list or let you do that, um, just email, um, if you email admin at eons.org.nz, <laughs> if there's any issues about registering, she'll love me for that. Um, but again, our website's um, under review, so uh, that whole part of our website is less than ideal, so I should apologise ahead of time. Okay, any last questions? I just popped this um, whakatauki in to finish us off with today um, because I do think it, it's really relevant. It gets used a lot, but actually EOTC is so important um, to what we do and offer across schools um, that we, we really need to share that responsibility for making sure our systems are robust, current, and we're providing quality um, EOTC to our ākonga um, out there and doing everything we possibly can um, to make sure that the system doesn't become a barrier uh, for getting our kids out and about because um, we I think everyone would agree that that's such a valuable part of their education and learning. So we're part of the Waka so please um, get in touch if we can support you in any way making that happen. All right, if there's nothing else, I'll say ka kite and thank you. Um, and I'll look forward to some emails. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>